Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, July 25th, 2024. Both political parties condemn the pro-Palestinian protesters who tore down and burned a U.S. flag at Union Station in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, while Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was giving a speech to Congress. The Prime Minister meets today with President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, the anticipated Democratic presidential nominee. Analysis today of President Biden's Oval Office address Wednesday night on why he has dropped out of the presidential race. Questions to the White House press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, and to former President Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee this year. U.S. House passes a resolution condemning Vice President Harris for her part in the Biden administration's border security and immigration policies. The Senate advances children online safety legislation. We'll talk about it with Lauren Finer senior reporter with The Verge. And First Lady Jill Biden leads the U.S. delegation to the Summer Olympics opening ceremonies in Paris. C-SPAN's Capitol Hill producer Craig Kaplan writing on X, the National Park Service raised three new large U.S. flags at Union Station in D.C. today after anti-Israeli protesters put up Palestinian flags yesterday during Prime Minister Netanyahu's address to Congress. Speaker Johnson and House Republicans temporarily replaced them with smaller U.S. flags last night. And an article from the Washington Post says that outside Union Station, pro-Palestinian protesters set an American flag ablaze, along with an effigy of Netanyahu, and spray-painted the Christopher Columbus Fountain and adjacent Liberty Bell reproduction with messages like, Free Gaza, all Zionists are bastards, and free Palestine. Police appeared to hit some demonstrators with a chemical irritant at multiple points during the day. That was from the Washington Post. Today on the Senate floor, the Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, talking about this. The lawless behavior of frenzied radicals in our own country over the past 36 hours only underscores the challenge facing the world's only Jewish state. When the Jewish people try to live in peace in their homeland, they're murdered in their beds. When Jewish students try to go to class, their classmates and professors lock arms to block their way. And when the leader of Israel comes to Washington, the same useful idiots and terrorist fifth columns clear their schedules to sow chaos. On Tuesday night, criminals vandalized the hotel where Prime Minister Netanyahu was staying, scattered crickets across hallways, covered a dinner table with maggots, and pulled the fire alarm. Outside, unhinged Hamasniks screamed, quote, we're going to kill all of you. Then, after vandalizing private property, radical organizers called another play, vandalizing federal property, tearing down and burning the American flag that flew over Columbus Circle and the Union Station, defacing public monuments with terrorist screeds. And lest anyone doubt their seriousness, burning the prime minister in effigy. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, today on the Senate floor. Former President Donald Trump, Republican presidential nominee this year, told Fox News Channel this morning, you should get a one-year jail sentence if you do anything to desecrate the American flag. He also said, now people will say, oh, it's unconstitutional. Those are stupid people. The Supreme Court ruled in 1989 in the case Texas v. Johnson that the act of burning the American flag is constitutionally protected free speech under the First Amendment. Vice President Kamala Harris, the expected Democratic presidential nominee this year, issuing a statement. Yesterday at Union Station in Washington, D.C., we saw despicable acts by unpatriotic protesters and dangerous hate-fueled rhetoric. I condemn any individuals associating with the brutal terrorist organization Hamas, which has vowed to annihilate the state of Israel and kill Jews. Pro-Hamas graffiti and rhetoric is abhorrent, and we must not tolerate it in our nation. I condemn the burning of the American flag. That flag is a symbol of our highest ideals as a nation and represents the promise of America. It should never be desecrated in that way. I support the right to peacefully protest, but let's be clear, anti-Semitism, hate, and violence of any kind have no place in our nation. That was the statement from Vice President Kamala Harris. 
And at today's White House briefing, questions to the White House National Security Communications Advisor, John Kirby. John, we heard from the Vice President earlier with comments, strict, uh, sorry, strong comments related to the vandalism and the protests that we saw yesterday. We haven't heard yet from the President or from the White House at large. Do you condemn what you saw yesterday? How do you characterize the protests, including what we saw at Union Station? Well, we did put out a statement uh, last night from the White House, um, but absolutely uh, condemn any violence uh, in protest activity. I mean, it's a First Amendment right to peacefully protest. We fully support that. We know that there are strong views um, about what's going on in Gaza. And some of those views uh, are in opposition to some of the policies that we're pursuing. We get it. That's democracy. But when it turns violent, and when you burn an American flag and pull it down off a U.S. government uh, b- 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 site, that's just absolutely unacceptable. And, and uh, obviously, we condemn all that. Are these protests pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, anti-Israel? How do you characterize what we're seeing? I think it's a little bit of all those things. I mean, um, I can't speak for the protesters. Obviously, I don't share their views. Uh, but um, obviously, they took great exception to uh, the prime minister speaking on Capitol Hill. And as I said, many of them have uh, take an exception with our with our policies with respect to Gaza. Today we heard from one of the family members who's going to be meeting with both the Prime Minister and the President a short time from now, Aviva Siegel. She was a former hostage of Hamas. She says, I want to ask President Biden if Bibi is not able or willing to agree to the ceasefire and hostage deal to bring the Americans home. Is there anything more that President Biden is prepared to do unilaterally to try to bring those hostages home? I wouldn't get into hy- hypothesis thighs and, uh, and speculating about um, options one way or the other. We want to get all the hostages home, clearly uh, the Americans in particular. And that's why this deal is so important, Peter. And we are close. Uh, we are closer now, we believe, than we've been before. Um, the gaps are closable, no question about that. Um, and we believe, the president believes, uh, that getting that hostage deal in place, getting that six-week ceasefire, that's the best way to get all these loved ones back with their families. White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby at today's White House news conference. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, and other House Republicans Wednesday night went to Union Station to put up three new U.S. flags on the flagpoles where the protesters had replaced the original U.S. flags with Palestinian flags. And Fox radio reporter Ryan Schmelz did an interview with the speaker. Where did this idea come from? Uh, Brandon Williams, our congressman from New York, had the idea. We were so outraged and disgusted by what happened here earlier today. You can see the monuments are painted with graffiti celebrating Hamas. So while Prime Minister Netanyahu here was representing our closest ally in the Middle East, our dear friend Israel, giving an inspirational talk to the Congress, they were here desecrating uh, Union Station. So one of the things they did, in addition to burning the American flag on the ground here, was they took the flags down from the flagpoles and they flew Palestinian flags over our Union Station. So all these members, veterans, patriots, came here today to set this right, get the American flags hoisted again, and we're happy to have gotten that done. What kind of message are you hoping to send? This is a message that we're going to stand for America, America's values, and freedom. That's what the flag represents. And we're the greatest, most powerful, strongest, most free nation in the history of the world. It's sad that people here don't understand or appreciate that. I I agree with the Prime Minister. These people are being used as useful idiots for Iran and its proxies, and it's it's shameful. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, interviewed by Fox Radio at Union Station in Washington, D.C., Wednesday night. Today, the House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York, was asked about this during his news conference on Capitol Hill. Considering the demonstrations that we saw outside the building and everything, many of these folks uh, associate with the left wing of your party. Talk about that divide and how you know, Republicans would use that as politics against uh, Democrats. And moreover, there were only, I think, 23 arrests here, uh, to grand total of Capitol Police and elsewhere. Should the District of Columbia uh, U.S. Attorney be trying to prosecute these folks more forcefully? Should that be an issue that maybe that, that there aren't more prosecutions? It's not clear to me that any of the protesters associate with the left wing of the Democratic Party when these are individuals who have been aggressively protesting members of the House Democratic Caucus every week, every month, year after year from October 7th in connection with our support for the special relationship between the United States and Israel. So that's a factual assumption that is inaccurate. With respect to the 
unlawful activity that we've seen take place, particularly immediately outside of Union Station, it is unacceptable to deface public property, desecrate the American flag, threaten Jews with violence, or promote terrorist organizations like Hamas. Unacceptable. Anyone who engages in that activity should be held accountable to the full extent of the law. Not that complicated. House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries at a news conference today. From Associated Press, after a mass demonstration Wednesday outside the Capitol, Gaza war protesters turned their focus to the White House, where President Joe Biden planned to meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu later in the day Thursday. The protesters chanted, arrest Netanyahu, and brought in an effigy of Netanyahu with blood on its hands and wearing an orange jumpsuit. The jumpsuit read, wanted for crimes against humanity. A small number of counter-protesters wore Israeli flags around their shoulders. That from AP. President Biden and the Prime Minister met today in the White House Oval Office. Well, welcome back. This is Prime Minister. We've got a lot to talk about. I think we should get to it. The floor is yours. Mr. President, we've known each other for uh, 40 years, and you've known every Israeli Prime Minister for 50 years. From Golden Gate. So from uh, a, a proud Jewish Zionist to a proud Irish-American Zionist, I want to thank you for uh, 50 years of public service and 50 years of support for the state of Israel. And I look forward to... Uh, discussing with you today and working with you in the months ahead on the great issues of course. I look forward to it. Well. By the way, that first meeting with Prime Minister Goldmayer, and she had an assistant sitting next to me, a guy named Rabin. That's how far back it was. I was only 12. Now. Anyway, thank you all for being here. You talk about the thank you. Thank you. President Joe Biden and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the White House. There was also a meeting today between the Prime Minister and Vice President Kamala Harris. And the Prime Minister plans to travel to Florida on Friday to meet with former President Donald Trump. Story from Inside Defense. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the recent U.S. and Canadian forces intercept of a joint military flight between two Russian and two Chinese aircraft off the coast of Alaska, the first time jets from those two countries have flown together near U.S. airspace, is further evidence of the deepening cooperation between Moscow and Beijing. The intercept was conducted by NORAD jets dispatched from the U.S. and Canada. That was reporting from Inside Defense. Here is Secretary Austin at a news conference today at the Pentagon. Russian and Chinese bombers were off uh, Alaska yesterday. I'm wondering if you could talk to us about what threat you think that growing cooperation uh, is to the U.S. and also particularly to the allies in Asia who were very concerned the, uh, with this growing activity. Thanks, Leah. Regarding uh, the Russian and Chinese aircraft that flew together um, uh, in the north um, here recently, um, this was not a surprise to us. We uh, closely monitored uh, uh, these aircraft, uh, tracked the aircraft, intercepted the aircraft, uh, and uh, which demonstrates that our, you know, our forces are at the ready all the time, and we have uh, we have very good uh, surveillance uh, capabilities. And and of course, I won't discuss any intelligence uh, issues here at the podium, uh, but. Um, Again, it's the first time that we've seen these two countries fly together uh, uh, like that. Uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't um, enter our airspace. Uh, I think the closest point of approach was about 200 miles off, the, off of our uh, uh, coast. So, uh, but this is a thing that, uh, that we track very closely. We're able to intercept, and, it, and if it happens again, if there's any kind of a challenge from, from any direction, uh, I have every confidence that uh, that uh, Northcom and NORAD uh, will will be at the ready and will be able to intercept. In terms of the relationship between uh, Russia and China, this is a, a relationship that we have been concerned about throughout. Most um, uh, mostly because we're concerned about China providing uh, uh, support to Russia's uh, illegal and unnecessary war in Ukraine. And we've seen evidence of, of that. 
uh, and uh, we would hope that uh, that would uh, that would cease going forward. Uh, but uh, but again, um, um, we'll see what happens and how this relationship continues to to develop. Uh, we will we'll remain focused on protecting the homeland here. And again, I applaud the efforts of Northcom and our great airmen. Uh, who are always at the ready. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at a Pentagon news conference along with General Charles C.Q. Brown, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A Washington Post article says that Chinese Defense Ministry spokesperson Zhang Xiaogang said in a press briefing Thursday that the flight was the eighth joint air strategic patrol carried out by the Chinese and Russian military since 2019. He added that the operation is not directed at any third party, complies with international law and practices, and is unrelated to the current international and regional situation. That Washington Post article also says that joint China-Russia military exercises are nothing new. However, U.S. Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks on Monday said China was seeking greater influence in the Arctic region and that there was growing cooperation between the PRC and Russia in the Arctic, something she described as troubling, reporting from the Washington Post. On Wall Street today, the Dow up 81, NASDAQ down 160, S&P down 27. From USA Today, the U.S. economy picked up sharply in the second quarter as a rise in consumer and business spending offset a drop in housing construction and a widening trade gap. The nation's gross domestic product, the value of all goods and services produced in the U.S., expanded at a seasonably adjusted annual rate of 2.8 percent in the April to June period. The Commerce Department said Thursday that it's up from a tepid gain of 1.4 percent early this year and 2.5 percent increase for all of 2023. That from USA Today. The Senate, right to the Washington Times, on Thursday advanced bipartisan bills designed to protect children who use social media, putting the legislation on track for passage despite opposition from civil liberties groups who said one of the measures would lead to censorship. Senators voted 86 to 1 to speed along the Kids Online Safety Act and the Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act in a procedural vote. The action followed months of debate about how to catch up with the digital age and reduce harm to young people. Final Senate passage is expected early next week, and President Biden has said he would sign the COSA bill if it clears the House. That from the Washington Times. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, spoke on the Senate floor before the vote. Today, the Senate takes a groundbreaking step towards ensuring our kids' online safety in the age of social media. As we all know, social media has many benefits, but with the benefits also comes risk. Many kids experience relentless online bullying. Kids' private personal data can be collected and used nefariously. Predators can exploit or target kids. And for kids who struggle with mental health, social media can magnify their anguish. I have met with the parents over and over again who have lost children in the flower of their lives because they were manipulated nefariously, maliciously by social media. We must stop that. And today, COSA and COPPA represent something very urgent. These bills will provide the appropriate guardrails necessary to protect kids against online threats. It's not an exaggeration to say these bills would be the most important updates in decades to federal laws that protect kids on the Internet. And it's a very good first step. And we did it with both sides working together, bipartisan, as this body ought to work, and I try to get it to work that way all the time. I want to thank my colleagues who championed these bills, Senators Blumenthal and Blackburn, Markey, Cassidy, Chair Cantwell, Chair Durbin, Senator Klobuchar, and so many others who really led the charge. Once the Senate clears today's procedural vote, COSA and COPPA will be on a glide path to final passage early next week. We should not delay a moment more. We should get the job done. Getting to this point wasn't easy. It's been a long and winding and difficult road. But we all kept going because we knew the results would be worth it. Most importantly, I want to thank the true heroes of this effort, the parents whose kids tragically took their own lives because of what happened to them on social media. 
The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, on the Senate floor. The Senate voting 86 to 1 to advance this legislation. The one no vote, Rand Paul, Republican from Kentucky, who also spoke. Like any other tool, the Internet can be misused, and parents must be vigilant. Parents must be vigilant in protecting their kids online. It is perhaps understandable that those who sit in this body might seek a government solution to protect children from any harms that may result from spending too much time on the Internet. But before we impose a drastic, first-of-its-kind legal duty on online platforms, we should ensure that the positive aspects of the Internet are preserved. That means we have to ensure that the First Amendment rights are protected, that these platforms are provided with clear rules so they can comply with the law. Unfortunately, this bill fails to do that in almost every respect. As currently written, this bill is far too vague, and many of its provisions are completely undefined. Senator Rand Paul, Republican from Kentucky, on the Senate floor. Lauren Feiner, senior policy reporter at The Verge, has been covering the Senate's work on the online child safety bills and joins us now. Thanks for being with us. The The Senate has been working on periodically talking publicly about this issue for a long time. Do we know why the bills are coming up now? Yeah, you know, this is a promise that uh, Chuck Schumer made to bring uh, COSA in particular to the floor and bring this legislation that... Um, he believes will protect kids on the internet. And, you know, we're in the last couple weeks stretch of Congress before they head home for the summer. And I think, you know, it was just the last chance before things really get into election mode um, to bring these bills up. COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act, you write that there's some opposition to it. Who and why? Yeah, so, you know, there has been a group that's been persistently opposed to COSA. There have been others that have been at least somewhat quelled by some changes that the sponsors have made. Um, but, you know, the groups that still oppose COSA are, are basically, you know, digital rights or free speech types of groups like the ACLU or the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, that basically believe that the duty of care that COSA would impose on online platforms would eventually result in, um, in violations of First Amendment protected speech. The other bill that's in this package, COPA, if that's the way you pronounce it, I saw a notice that it's COPA 2.0. Yeah, so... Uh, The original version of COPPA, which passed in 1998, um, was really a landmark piece of children's privacy legislation. Um, And, you know, that set some protections for kids under the age of 13 on the Internet. COPPA 2.0 is meant to kind of raise the standard um, that was kind of originally set by that bill. Um, For example, raising the age to... um, kids under 17, um, and also banning targeted advertising to kids. So the initial vote today to advance the bill, only one senator in opposition, so it's looking good for passage. When would that happen? Yeah, Senator Schumer said that we could see these bills basically on a glide path um, to passage early next week. Um, And, you know, of course, the House is leaving town soon, so it might be a while until we see this taken up in that chamber, but it definitely looks on track to pass the Senate. And what might be the prospects for passage in the House, and what does the White House think about it? Yeah, in the House, it's a little bit harder to say just because we haven't seen uh, the companion bill discussed over there as much since this originated in the Senate. But it seems like Speaker Johnson is open to the legislation and um, said he was, you know, taking a look at it and seemed to appreciate its goals. So I think, you know, it is possible that we see him take up that bill. Um, But again, you know, once there's time for more lawmakers to pour over it and decide what they think, um, you know, things could change. We're talking with Lauren Feiner from The Verge historical context, the last time there was a law dealing with online protection for children was 25 years ago. A lot of people who wanted to make changes 
and say it hasn't been done, point to the power of the technology companies. Have have they weighed in on this yet? And perhaps will they now? Yeah, so there's only been a handful of tech companies that have gone out and endorsed COSA. And they haven't been, you know, the biggest tech companies that we think of. It's been, um, you know, smaller firms or, you know, firms that think they're generally already in line with COSA and its goals. Um, But we do see for sure the industry groups um, taking an oppositional stance to COSA. They think that um, they're among the group that thinks that it would result in um, a a limiting of content on the Internet for kids and potentially for adults as well um, in order to avoid liability under this act. What do voters think of this issue when they when they talk about it? Does it rank high in, in their priorities? Yeah, I think it's definitely an issue that a lot of people care about. I think, you know, a lot of people, a lot of parents in particular seem to really be struggling right now with how to protect their kids on the Internet. There's so many different tools. There's so many different um, types of parental controls. Nothing's really standardized across services. And I think that's what lawmakers have been hearing and acting on is that they're hearing their constituents come to them and say, we need we need some kind of answer, and this is the answer that they've come come up with. Lauren Feiner, senior policy reporter at The Verge. You can find her articles at theverge.com and on X at Lauren underscore Feiner. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And a reminder that C-SPAN covers the Senate gavel to gavel as well as the House. The House is on C-SPAN television, the Senate on C-SPAN 2, both on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and both streamed at cspan.org. Washington Today continues in a moment. As more people cancel cable TV, C-SPAN's funding is at risk. This summer, an anonymous donor has stepped up to help by matching all donations up to $25,000. I'm Caitlin with C-SPAN, and this means your gift will go twice as far. Your donation supports unfiltered access to government and public affairs programming, including the C-SPAN podcasts you value. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Every dollar helps us reach our $25,000 goal. Thank you for listening and supporting C-SPAN. Donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. Story at Fox News, the House of Representatives voted along bipartisan lines to condemn Vice President Kamala Harris's handling of the U.S. southern border the first piece of legislation targeting Harris since she became the Democrats' presumptive 2024 nominee. Six Democrats joined all Republicans in voting for the measure, which passed 220 to 196. The House Democrats who voted for the resolution are Jared Golden of Maine, Marie Lusenkamp Perez of Washington State, Mary Peltola of Alaska, Henry Cuellar of Texas, Don Davis of North Carolina, and Yadira Caraveo of Colorado. For years, Republicans have accused Harris of failing her job as border czar after President Biden handed her the task of mitigating the root causes of illegal immigration in 2021. That's the article from Fox News. The sponsor of the resolution is Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, Republican from New York. I rise to condemn Vice President Kamala Harris for her failed and dangerous policies as Joe Biden's border czar that caused the most catastrophic border crisis in modern history. No matter what congressional district you go to, the number one issue facing Americans is Kamala Harris's open border crisis. And by every metric, Kamala Harris has failed to secure our borders. Instead, advancing far-left Democrats failed open border policies and the needs of illegal immigrants over the safety of Americans. This resolution condemns Kamala Harris's role as Joe Biden's open border czar and affirms that the American people deserve elected officials who understand the gravity of the crisis at the border and will, who will work to secure the border. Now, Democrats will try to run from this record, but they cannot hide. Joe Biden's open borders are Kamala Harris, and every elected Democrat is responsible for this border crisis, along with every other aspect of Joe Biden's failed and feckless record, which brought not only the border crisis, but skyrocketing Biden inflation, surging violent crimes, chaos and weakness around the world. 
We all remember the widely publicized delegation that Vice President Kamala Harris uh, conducted and led saying, do not come, do not come. And millions of illegals poured into our country since then because of Kamala Harris and Joe Biden's administration's unconstitutional illegal executive actions wiping away President Trump's effective border security policies, which created the most secure border in modern history. The American people know that. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, Republican from New York, the House Republican Conference Chair, today on the House floor. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, Democrat from Washington State, who is chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, opposed this resolution. Here we go again. The Republican majority made their appropriations bills so extreme that they can't pass the vast majority of them with votes from their own party. So instead, we're going to come here to the floor and waste our time as they politicize the work that we are doing here in Congress and use this time to attack the vice president. They can't pursue their impeachment claims, their fake impeachment claims of Joe Biden or any other number of people that they've targeted because Joe Biden is no longer running for president. So now they've got to quickly shift and instead use their time on this floor where we are supposed to be doing official business to attack Vice President Harris days after she is clearly going to be our Democratic nominee for president. Kamala Harris was never the border czar. She was never asked to address the situation at the border. She was asked to do something that mega extremists who want quick fixes that they can give to Fox News never want to focus on, and that is a real solution. She was narrowly tasked with developing agreements that could help bring government and private sector investments to those countries that are sending migrants to the United States so that those countries could help strengthen the conditions in those countries. And she did so most significantly in Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. She brought billions from private sector investments to support government funding for entrepreneurs, to ensure labor rights, to strengthen food security, and launch projects across those countries that invested in financial inclusion, health care, climate finance, and affordable housing. Those are the things that will keep migrants in their home countries. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, Democrat from Washington State, on the House floor. Before the House voted to pass this non-binding resolution, 220 to 196, six Democrats joining all Republicans in voting yes. This is a House resolution, so it does not go to the Senate and would not go to the President to be signed or vetoed. The White House today issued what it called a fact sheet that begins... The presidential proclamation issued by President Biden to temporarily suspend the entry of certain non-citizens across the southern border, including the southwest land and southern coastal borders, and the complementary joint interim final rule issued by Department of Homeland Security and Department of Justice have now been in effect for seven weeks, helping reduce the number of encounters at our southwest border by 55 percent. The Border Patrol's seven-day average has decreased to below 1,800 encounters per day. The word historic has appeared a lot in headlines describing President Joe Biden's Oval Office speech Wednesday night to the nation in which he addressed for the first time why he decided to stop seeking the Democratic presidential nomination. An article at The Week has a list of previous U.S. presidents who chose not to run for re-election, and there are only six, and the last one was Lyndon Johnson, 1968. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre was questioned at today's White House briefing about the reasons President Biden gave. One thing the president did not say was explicitly why he stepped aside. He, you know, he talked about how he believed in the best interest of the country to step aside. But why did he, did he believe he was going to lose to Donald Trump? Look, I think that the president actually answered this question. I think, wait, no, no, no. I think the American people think he answered the question. He said, I revere this office, but I love my country more. He said, I draw strength and I enjoy in working for the American people, but this sacred task of perfecting our union is not about me. It's about you, our families, your families, your futures. And I've decided the best way, the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. That's the best way to unite our nation. He talked about unity. He talked about passing the torch. Uh, I know there is a time and a place for long years of experience in public life, 
but there's also a time and a place for new voices, fresh voices, yes, younger voices, and that time and place is now. That is what he said. That is why he laid out why he's passing the torch, why it's time to give, give it over to new, fresh voices. And he also talked about unity. And I would also refer back uh, to his letter where he talked about also wanting to unify his party. Did the president believe that his presence in that race was divisive? <laughs> I'm not gonna get into more than what the president laid out. He talked about unity. He talked about bringing the, the party together. He talked about p putting the country first. He talked about passing over the torch, uh, bringing in new voices. I think he laid out very clearly why he decided to make this decision. And I believe the American people got it. They understood it. If it's clear, I wouldn't ask the question, but I'll, I'll move I on. I think it's clear. Okay. I do. So I think the, the American people do. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre at today's White House News Conference. Former President Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee, reacted this morning on Fox News Channel to President Biden's Wednesday night Oval Office speech. Do you think we learned why Joe Biden left, uh, decided not to run against you? Well, I think it was a coup. They didn't want him running. He was way down in the polls and they thought he was going to lose. They went to him and they said, you can't win the race, which I think is true unless I did something very foolish, which I wasn't going to do. And I think he was so far down, and they said, you're not going to win, and you're not in great shape, and you did poorly in the debate. I think the debate started everything. We really started the fall if if he didn't have the debate. And remember, they challenged me. I didn't challenge them. They said, uh, let's have a, deba a debate. They gave me everything I didn't want from uh, Jake Tapper to everybody else <laughs> in CNN. And, you know, they, I said, I'll take it because I was surprised that he was willing to debate. So we debated. It didn't turn out well, but it, it really began from the debate. And the ratings, his his approval numbers went very bad. And I was beating him by a lot. And, and all of a sudden, uh, you could see what was happening. They were trying to do a coup. And, you know, I have it from very good information. I know a lot of people on the other side, too, that they went and they forced him out between Pelosi and Obama and some others that... Right. You see on television, it was interesting. I'd watch them on television, and they act so nice. Oh, yes, we love Joe. We love Joe. Behind the scenes, I know for a fact they were brutal. Former President Donald Trump on Fox News Channel this morning. Later in the interview, he gave a critique of President Biden's delivery in the Oval Office speech Wednesday night. You look at the other networks, they say, oh, wasn't that a wonderful speech? Wasn't he wonderful? It was just, it was terrible. It was like a terrible speech. And uh, terrible delivery. He looked like uh, he was having problems. And yet you watch the other networks and you would think he was uh, Ronald Reagan in his prime, Winston Churchill in his prime. <laughs> and he wasn't. It was not good. Yeah. It was not a good it was not a good speech. Uh, the look, the sound, the voice, everything. Former President Donald Trump on Fox News Channel this morning. Story from AP, Vice President Kamala Harris told reporters on Thursday that she's ready to debate Donald Trump. She accused him of backpedaling away from a previous agreement for a debate hosted by ABC News on September 10th. The September 10th debate was one of two debates that President Joe Biden and Trump had agreed on. The first one was hosted by CNN on June 27th, but Biden has since dropped out of the race and endorsed Harris as his successor. Trump has said he would prefer to shift the debate to Fox News but he would be willing to face off with Harris more than once. That was the article from the Associated Press. Vice President Harris spoke to reporters at Joint Base Andrews. So many of you have been asking me about the debate, and I'll tell you, I'm ready to debate Donald Trump. Um, I have agreed to the previously agreed upon September 10th debate. He agreed to that previously. Now it appears he's backpedaling, but I'm ready. And I think the voters deserve to see the split screen that exists in this race on a debate stage. And so I'm ready. Let's go. Will you do it on Fox News? comment on the protest yesterday. Vice President Kamala Harris expected Democratic presidential nominee in about a week. Speaking today in the tarmac at Joint Base Andrews, returning from Houston, where she spoke to the American Federation of Teachers. WLS in Chicago reports the Secret Service shared new details Thursday about the security perimeter around the Democratic National Convention. Thousands of Democrats will converge on the United Center and McCormick Place beginning August 19th. The Secret Service is under intense scrutiny after former President Donald Trump was shot at a campaign rally. Secret Service, in connection with the Chicago police and other law enforcement agencies, 
had been preparing for the convention for about a year and a half. That was the article from WLS. Derek Meyer, deputy special agent in charge of the FBI field office in Chicago, was part of a news conference today in that city. The perimeter maps you will soon see were carefully crafted with input from our public safety partners, community groups, local businesses, traffic and transportation experts. The Secret Service has also been working closely with our counterparts in the Department of Homeland Security and at the White House since the incident took place on July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania. We have reviewed the security plan for the DNC and remain confident. Our plan allows us to adjust for any possible scenario. Earlier this month, the Secret Service coordinated security for the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee and the NATO Summit in Washington, D.C. These events were conducted in a secure environment, and we expect similar results in Chicago. This is a city that regularly works together to host large-scale events such as the NASCAR race, Lollapalooza, and Taste of Chicago. The Chicago Police Department plays a pivotal role in the success of these events, and Superintendent Snelling has a tremendous partner has been a tremendous partner. The superintendent is among 17 public safety entities, including the U.S. Secret Service, participating in the Executive Steering Committee. This committee oversaw the development of the DNC Operational Security Plan, relying on subcommittee staff with experts on various topics, including national intelligence, consequence management, maritime security, airspace security, traffic control, traffic control, and more. The DNC plan has subsequently been tested and reinforced through multiple interagency exercises over the past four months, including five tabletop exercises and numerous field training operations. These run-throughs allow our law enforcement partners to evaluate the security plans throughout various scenarios. We will host a final training exercise just days before the official arrival of the first delegates. These exercises, previous experiences with large-scale events, and extensive planning all contribute to a level of confidence ahead of the convention. Our preparation includes detailed procedures for planned and pop-up demonstrations. I want everyone to know that the Secret Service and our public safety partners respect everyone's, every American's First Amendment rights. The superintendent has assured that CPD is well-equipped to manage protests and plans are in place to keep those gatherings safe. The shared goal is for everyone to express their views lawfully while ensuring a secure environment for delegates, convention attendees, and the general public. Derek Meyer, Deputy Special Agent in Charge, FBI Field Office, Chicago, at a news conference today in Chicago, along with Larry Snelling, Chicago Police Superintendent, Brandon Johnson, the Mayor of Chicago, and Governor J.B. Pritzker of Illinois. There will be two perimeters for the Democratic National Convention venues, similar to the protections that were put in place at the Republican National Convention last week in Milwaukee. An outer perimeter where vehicles will be allowed, an inner perimeter where only credentialed delegates and media will be allowed on foot. A story from WTTW PBS Chicago. Cook County court officials are prepping for the possibility of mass arrest during next month's Democratic National Convention by freeing up judges and clearing non-essential proceedings should they be called upon to handle an influx of cases. First Lady Jill Biden, who was in the White House Oval Office Wednesday night when her husband, President Joe Biden, gave a national address on his decision to stop running for re-election, today was in Paris as the head of the U.S. delegation to the opening ceremonies of the Summer Olympics. The First Lady spoke at a reception at the U.S. Ambassador's residence to families of athletes on Team USA. When Team USA glides through the opening ceremony tomorrow night, they carry more than just our flag. They carry our nation's heart and our hopes with them too. They show the world who we are as Americans, determined, optimistic, and resilient. That our strength is found not only in our strides and swings, but in our hearts and in our minds that with all precious, our precious differences and infinite similarities, we are always one team. It's what I love about our country, that we are united, and together we can reach for every possibility. President Biden has led our country with that hope always in his heart. As he says... 
Thank you. I'll take that home to him. And as he says, there is nothing America can't do when we do it together. And we see that especially now at the Olympics. In this moment, we are more than our cities or states or backgrounds. We are more than our jobs or our political parties. We are all, first and foremost, Team USA. That's the gift your families give us. The president, the vice president, second gentleman, and I are grateful for everything you do, and so is your country. And so are your athletes. You are their biggest supporters, the ones who cheer even when the world isn't watching. But over the next couple weeks, as you peer through parted fingers or whispered prayers with closed eyes, know that the nation is by your side, cheering just as hard, adding our belief and our hope to yours. God bless you all, and go Team USA! Thank you. First Lady Jill Biden in Paris speaking to family of the Summer Olympics Team USA, which numbers about 600 athletes, as she mentioned, opening ceremonies Friday night, and the games run through August 11th. An Associated Press article reads that as the Paris Olympics are set to open this week, the United States goes in as the favorite to win the most medals. China is unlikely to overtake the U.S. in the overall medal hall, but has a chance to win more gold medals than the Americans. The forecast is by Nielsen's Grace Note, which supplies statistical analysis for sports leagues around the world, also tracks major competitions involving Olympic sports leading up to the Games. That from AP. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word. You'll get the stories making headlines in Washington, emailed to you every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. C-SPAN's Washington Journal, our live forum involving you to discuss the latest issues in government, politics, and public policy from Washington and across the country. Coming up Friday morning, the Daily Mail senior political reporter Charlie Spieri talks about his book Amateur Hour, Kamala Harris in the White House. And the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, William Barber, discusses his new book on poverty in the United States and the latest news in the 2024 presidential race. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Join in the conversation live at 7 Eastern Friday morning on C-SPAN. C-SPAN Now, our free mobile video app or online at cspan.org.